Thank you, Andy. Okay, so hello everyone. I hope that you're already enjoying that great conference. We have here a lot of great speakers, a lot of great content. And over the next one hour, I want to talk about myths and misconceptions about locking and blocking in SQL Server. My name is Klaus Aschenbrenner. I'm based in Vienna in Austria, so in Europe. So at my time soon, it's already 9 p.m. in the evening. Not that late, but still already 9 p.m. in the evening. I provide with my company SQL Passion, SQL Server Consultancy and Training Services across Europe. I'm specialized in the relational engine of SQL Server. So my main topics are performance tuning, performance troubleshooting, high availability stuff. And I'm not doing that much with business intelligence, data warehousing, machine learning, and all that crazy stuff. Just the relational engine of SQL Server doesn't sound that much, but trust me, the relational engine of SQL Server can be very, very complicated. I'm also a Microsoft certified master for SQL Server which is the highest technical certification that you can achieve on SQL Server. I have also written the book Pro SQL Server 2008 Service Broker, which was published by APRIS in the summer of 2008, so already a very, very long time ago. Service Broker is an asynchronous messaging framework that Microsoft first introduced back with SQL Server 2005. And with Service Broker, you are able to write message-based asynchronous database applications. You can also follow me on Twitter and you find more information about my person, my services on my website, sqlpassion.at, where I also regularly blog about SQL Server and other IT related topics. Okay, so what's the agenda for the next 60 minutes? More or less, I want to talk about some myths and misconceptions around locking and blocking in SQL Server. So I assume that you already know the basics about locking and blocking. So you should have a basic understanding about shared locks, exclusive locks in SQL Server. Just a brief recap here, a shared lock is acquired by SQL Server every time when we are reading records, an exclusive lock is acquired by SQL Server every time when we change a record, when we delete a record, or when we insert a new record into a table. And the most important thing here to remember is that a shared lock is incompatible to an exclusive lock. It means when you are holding a shared lock on a row, and you want to change that row concurrently, SQL Server tries to acquire an exclusive lock and SQL Server can't get that exclusive lock because it's blocked by the shared lock. Means in that case, the shared lock uh, is blocking the exclusive lock. And also vice versa, when you're currently modifying a row, you're holding an exclusive lock. And when you want to concurrently read that row, SQL Server would try to acquire a shared lock. And that shared lock, again, can't be acquired because it's blocked by the exclusive lock. So in that case, a writer blocks a reader, and a reader always blocks a writer. And of course, you can't have two exclusive locks at the same row at the same point in time. Means when one transaction changes a row and another transaction also wants to also wants to change that row, you would also have a blocking situation in SQL Server. So just a brief recap about locking and blocking in SQL Server. So in the first step, I want to talk about the famous no lock query hint. A lot of people are thinking as soon as you are using the no lock query hint, your queries will not block anymore. And in that first example, I want to show you a concrete scenario where even a query with the no lock query hint can block. After that one, we will continue our discussion by talking about the isolation level read committed. Normally in read committed, 
SQL Server acquires a shared log as long as you are processing that shared log uh, during the execution of the execution plan. Means when the execution plan has processed that row, SQL Server immediately releases that shared log. And in some circumstances, our default isolation level read committed can behave as the isolation level repeatable read. Means that SQL Server is holding its shared logs till the end of the transaction. So in that second uh, section, I want to give you a concrete example where the isolation level read committed behaves the same as the isolation level repeatable read. And then we continue our discussion by talking about log escalations. Log escalations are also a very, very important topic in SQL Server because with log escalations, SQL Server improves the scalability of the log manager. Normally, SQL Server acquires logs on the row level. Imagine you have a table and then that table you have millions or even billions of rows. Imagine you're reading all those rows. You would need to acquire a shared log on every individual row. This would be quite inperformant. And therefore, SQL Server implements so-called log escalations, means SQL Server escalates those individual logs to one log to the table level. Maybe you end up with a shared log on the table level, or maybe you are ending up with an exclusive log on the table level. And in that section, I want to prove to you that log escalations are only happening in SQL Server when it's possible. Imagine SQL Server would trigger a log escalation, and that log escalation would lead to a blocking situation. This would be counter. Uh, this would be counterintuitive in SQL Server, and therefore lock escalations are only happening in SQL Server when they are possible from the current locking perspective. And finally, I want to talk a I want to talk about a very very interesting feature in SQL Server called online index operations. Online index operations means that you can rebuild your clustered and non-clustered indexes as online operations in SQL Server. Means when you have a concurrent read or write activity, that read and write activity doesn't influence your online index operation. That's the way how Microsoft sells that feature to you. And as we will see in that section, online index operations this is just a marketing term used by Microsoft. They are in no way online operations because you can also have here serious blocking situations. Okay, so let's start by talking about the no lock query hint. As I've mentioned in the beginning, every time when you read a row in SQL Server, SQL Server requires a shared lock. Means with that shared lock, you are making that row read only. Nobody else can change that row. As I've said, when you want to change a row, you need to acquire an exclusive lock. And the exclusive lock is incompatible with the shared lock. It means in that case, your update statement, your delete statement would have to wait until your select statement releases that shared lock. And then your update or delete statement can proceed with its work. And in the meantime, you have a traditional blocking situation. And what a lot of people are doing, they are just using the no lock query hint because the no lock query hint makes your query very, very fast. It just finishes immediately or almost immediately. No lock just means that SQL Server doesn't acquire a shared lock. It's the same as the isolation level read uncommitted. As the name si says, or as the name implies, read uncommitted means you're reading maybe uncommitted data. Imagine someone else is currently changing a row. Maybe you are changing a value of ABC to the value DEF. And now you are reading that row you are getting back already the new value of DEF, 
but that value isn't yet committed means when the other update statement rolls back, you have read and processed uncommitted data in your select statement. So read uncommitted or the query hint no log is very, very dangerous because it can happen that you are returning or that SQL Server returns you uncommitted data. So read uncommitted or no log makes sense when you don't need a precise correct result. Imagine you want to know how many sales I have today. Or how many sales do I have in that week, in that month? When you have run that query, uh, the result of that query is already old. So in that case, no log or read uncommitted maybe makes sense. But if you are relying on precise, correct results, no log or the isolation level read uncommitted doesn't make sense in any way. And now let's switch over to SQL Server Management Studio. And I want to show you a concrete example where a query with the no log query hint can also block. In the first step, let's create here a new database. And I'm creating here a very simple table. So just three integer columns. And in the next step, let's insert here 1,000 records. And as you can see, we have here a very, very simple table. Normally, when I'm doing demonstrations, I'm just using simple tables because I want to show the concrete problem, the concrete concept to you. So what we are doing here, we begin a new transaction and imagine now in that transaction, you are changing your table data. Maybe like in that case, you are adding a new column to that table or maybe you're rolling out changes into your production database. Maybe you're adding indexes, you're dropping indexes, you are changing existing indexes. Of course, you are doing that in an explicit transaction because everything should happen or nothing should happen. So you are doing that in the context of a transaction, you have a begin transaction, you're doing your work, and finally you are committing or rolling back your transaction. Currently, we have started that transaction. And now imagine the following. I have here a second session. We also use that database. And now let's try to read from that table. As you know, that table is very, very small, 1,000 records. Hmm. Query is slow, very, very slow. Hmm. Every time, when I have a query which is slow, I'm always telling the people, well, it's a query. Forget about your query. You have to concentrate on your execution plan because only the execution plan is telling you what SQL Server is doing in that query. So let's have a look on the estimated execution plan. We click here, display estimated execution plan. And it's slow, very slow. We even can't request an estimated execution plan from the query optimizer. So what is happening here? Well, the problem is we have here an active transaction. And in that transaction, we are changing our table. We are adding a fourth additional column. And in that case, SQL Server acquires a so-called schema modification lock. Schema modification lock is a very, very restrictive lock. So when we look here into the lock manager with the dynamic management view, system to unlocks, you can see that we have here on one object, this is our table, you have here the table ID. We have a schema modification lock, which we have granted. And the problem is now, when the query optimizer tries to compile an execution plan for you, the query optimizer requests a so-called schema stability lock. 
So the query optimizer just makes sure that during the query compilation, nobody else is changing those tables because you are referencing those tables in the execution plan. Therefore, those tables must remain stable. They are not allowed to change. You are not allowed to make table changes. Like in our case, you are not allowed to add an index or to drop an index. Imagine the query optimizer would reference in the execution plan an index, which is already dropped. Oh my God. And therefore we have that schema stability lock. And the schema stability lock is just incompatible with the schema modification lock. As you can see, we have here a session ID of 64, which is currently executing, or in our case, it's waiting. Let's have a look on the session ID 64 in the lock manager. And as you can see, we are waiting here on a schema stability lock. And therefore, it doesn't help you in any way when you are now adding to your select statement the no lock query hint. The query is also blocking. Well, technically speaking, the query is not blocking. No, the query optimizer is blocking because the query optimizer is waiting on the schema stability lock. At that point in time where we have currently our blocking situation, SQL Server has no idea about the execution plan itself. Therefore, that no lock query hint doesn't help you here in any way because you don't know at that point in time how you are accessing that table. We are waiting on the compilation of an execution plan. And therefore, the no lock query hint is no guarantee that you have no weights in a select statement. And as you can see, when we now finish our transaction with a rollback or with a commit, we release that schema modification lock. Then the query optimizer can acquire the schema stability lock and finally compiles the execution plan, which is handed over to the query executor, which finally executes that query. As you can see, we have now a result. It took more than one minute. So just think about it. The no log query hint is no guarantee that you have no blocking situations. When you are making, for example, deployments into your uh, production environment where you are changing the table definitions, where you are adding indexes, where you are dropping indexes, you would run into that problem. So you have to be aware of that. Let's switch back to PowerPoint. So that's the story about the no lock query hint. So no lock, as I've said, is no guarantee that you have no blocking situations in SQL Server. Let's continue now by talking about the isolation level read committed. As I've said previously, in read committed, SQL Server acquires a shared lock every time when you process that row in the execution plan. As soon as you have processed that row in the execution plan, SQL Server immediately releases that shared lock. So SQL Server is holding a shared lock only for a very, very small time on a row. A problem is now when you are reading in a transaction the same row multiple times, it can happen that that row is changing over the time so that you're seeing just different row versions. Therefore, in the isolation level read committed, you have no so-called read stability. Means that row version can change in the context of your transaction. If you want to have that read stability, you have to change your isolation level to repeatable read. So you have to set a more restrictive isolation level. In repeatable read, SQL Server acquires a shared lock and doesn't release that shared lock anymore. SQL Server only releases that shared lock on a row when you have finished your transaction with a commit or rollback. So SQL Server is holding in the isolation level repeatable read those shared locks till the end of the transaction. So when you're holding a shared lock, you are making that row more or less read only. Means 
when someone else tries to change that row, the other transaction acquires or tries to acquire an exclusive lock. That exclusive lock is blocked by the share block. So in that case, a reader blocks a writer. And as an outcome, as a side effect, you have a read stability. You have so-called repeatable reads. You're reading one row version in your transaction, and that row version can't change anymore because you have set your isolation level to repeatable read. The problem is now that behavior of repeatable read can also happen in the isolation level read committed. Just think about it. There are some specific scenarios where SQL Server can behave as in the isolation level repeatable read. More or less, when you have tables uh, with LOB data types, for example, a far char max data type, a far binary max data type. So all those data types that were introduced back with SQL Server 2005, so already a very, very long time ago. So that's the first prerequisite. You need an LOB data type in your table definition. And the second prerequisite is that you have in your execution plan a so-called stop and go operator. Normally, in the execution plan, you have so-called pass-through operators, means one operator requests a row from the upfront operator, is performing some work with that row, and set, sends that row to the next operator in the execution plan, means your rows are just flowing through your execution plan from the right to the left. Those are pass-through operators. And some operators are stop and go operators. For example, a sort operator, a hash operator, like a hash match or hash aggregate operator. Those are stop and go operators. They must consume the whole input. Imagine a sort operator. When you are sorting rows, you have to consume the whole input then you are doing your sort in the context of SQL Server, it's a merge sort algorithm that SQL Server is using. And then you are returning your sorted output. So a sort operator can't be a pass through operator. Maybe the last row that you are getting, maybe from a clustered index scan, is the first row that you have to return as a sorted output. Therefore, you have to consume in the first step the whole input. Then you are doing something with that input. And then you're returning the result. This is a stop and go operator. And if you have a stop and go operator on a table definition with a max data type, with an LOB data type, SQL Server behaves in the default isolation level we'd committed as if that transaction would run in repeatable read. I've mentioned here a few blog postings which are describing the internal details why SQL Server has to behave in that specific way. I don't have that much time to go here into the technical details. You can just check out those blog postings. So let's switch now back to SQL Server Management Studio and let's have a look on a concrete example. <clears throat> So let's create a new database. And within that database, I'm again creating a very simple table. So as you can see, uh, I have here a test table. I'm using here an int identity column, which is enforced by a primary key constraint, means SQL Server creates in the background a unique clustered index. Then we have a second column, integer column, and now our third column as a far char max column means we can store in one column up to two gigabytes of data. So that data type was introduced back with SQL Server 2005. So already a very, very long time ago. 
Let's insert now a few rows. Of course, I'm not stupid and I'm just inserting here a few bytes, not up to two gigabytes. This would take a little bit longer. So just a few bytes doesn't matter for that example. So we have again, a very simple table. And now in the next step, I'm beginning a transaction and I'm updating the third row of our clustered index means when we run that update statement against that third row, we have here the primary key constraint, the clustered key on the first column ID. Then we have here an exclusive lock on the third row. Means every time when we of course now perform a select statement against that table, we're running into a blocking situation. So this is now more or less just a test setup. The interesting thing is now when we are running a select statement, which shared locks SQL Server is acquiring and which shared locks SQL Server is holding in the context of a transaction. So let's switch to a second session. Let's go to that database and let's run a simple select statement. Of course, the select statement is now blocking. In that case, the no lock query hint would help you here because with the no lock query hint, we wouldn't acquire a shared lock and therefore that select statement would be finished immediately. So we are waiting here on the third row, which we have here exclusively locked. So let's look now into the lock manager. As we have seen previously, we can query the lock manager through system exec, uh, system uh, twin locks. We restrict on our session ID. Session ID 57 is waiting. So let's have a look. Which locks session ID 57 has acquired? As you can see, we have here a shared lock on the database level. Makes sense because we are using that database. Therefore, nobody else can drop in the meantime that database because for dropping a database, you would need an exclusive lock which would have to wait. When we look further, we have a lock on the object level. That's our table lock. We have here a so-called intent shared lock, which we also got because we have the request status of granted. SQL Server also acquires locks on the page level. So the page is a unit of eight kilobytes on which SQL Server is storing your data in your data files and also in the buffer pool in main memory. So every row in SQL Server belongs to a page of eight kilobytes. That page belongs to a partition and the partition belongs to a table in SQL Server. So SQL Server more or less implements a locking hierarchy. This is also very important when we talk later about lock escalations in SQL Server. And finally, on the lowest level, on the record level, we have here a key lock. A key means you're dealing here with an index, a clustered index or non-clustered index. If you would see here a so-called RID lock, read lock, uh, you would deal with a heap table because in a heap table, you have no keys. Here you have a so-called row identifier lock. It's just an indication that you're dealing with a heap table. And as you can see now, we are waiting here on that shared lock that we are trying to acquire. Makes sense because someone else has already an incompatible exclusive lock. In our case, session ID 56 has here the exclusive lock. You can also prove that when we look here, where resource description, resource description is a hash value of our key. So when we pass that in, you can see that we have in the lock manager two locks on that resource description. One session has successfully acquired an exclusive lock, session ID 56 that one here, and session ID 57 is waiting on the shared lock. So this is a traditional blocking situation. A writer blocks a reader 
our update statement blocks the select statement. So this is the, this is the default behavior of read committed. Nothing special here. Let's cancel that query. As you have seen here in that select statement, I have referenced column two. When we look back to our table definition, column two is our integer data type. Let's change now our query and let's select column three. Column three, as you know, is our Fartcher max data type, means it can store up to two gigabytes of data. Let's run that query. Of course, that query is blocking again because we have, we have on the third row already an exclusive lock and we can't read that third row. But now let's have a look again on the lock manager and let's see which locks we are currently holding. We have again our database lock. We have the lock on the object level, the table level. We have one indent shared lock on the page level. And oh my God, we have here three key locks. So we have locked now three rows. As you can see on the first and second row, we have acquired a shared lock, but SQL Server hasn't released that shared lock anymore. So more or less, SQL Server is now behaving as in the isolation level repeatable read. SQL Server is holding those shared locks till the end of the transaction. And of course, we are waiting on the third row because the third row is currently exclusively locked by session ID 56. So as you can see in that example, SQL Server is behaving now as when you would run that transaction in the isolation level, repeatable read. SQL Server acquires a shared lock and only releases that shared lock at the end of your transaction. So this is a completely different behavior. So when you are running your transactions in read committed, there's also no 100% guarantee that SQL Server will release its shared locks immediately. It depends. It depends on the table definition. We know column three is an LOP data type. And in addition, it depends on the execution plan. When we now look on the estimated execution plan, you see we have a clustered index scan operator. We are reading from our cluster table. And then we have a sort operator, that blocking operator that I have mentioned previously, that sort must consume the whole input from the clustered index scan operator. Then SQL Server performs the sort. As I've said, SQL Server performs here merge sort algorithm. And finally, after that sort has happened, SQL Server returns you to the next operator, in our case, to the select operator, the sorted output. But in the meantime, during that sort operation, no row is returned to the select operator. The, the, the sort operator is a stop and go operator. And in combination with that LOP data type, SQL Server is holding its shared logs till the end of the transaction. So just think about it. Read committed is no guarantee that you are releasing shared logs immediately. Perfect. Let's switch back to PowerPoint. So that's the story about holding locks in read committed. <clears throat> Let's continue now by talking about lock escalations in SQL Server. As we have already seen, when we looked into the lock manager, SQL Server implements a whole locking hierarchy. We have a shared lock on the table level, or we have a lock on the table level. This can be a shared lock. This can be an exclusive lock, maybe some other locks. We have locks on the page level. As I've said, the page is a unit of eight kilobytes, which SQL Server is storing in your data files and also in the buffer pool. 
your in-memory cache of SQL Server. And those pages also must be locked. We've already seen that in the previous example. And finally, SQL Server acquires locks on the row level. Sounds good. Imagine we change a table. Imagine we have a table with millions or maybe billions of rows. And now we are running an update statement again, the whole table. In that case, SQL Server has to lock every row with an exclusive lock. And of course, SQL Server also has to hold those exclusive locks till the end of the transaction. An exclusive lock is always hold, always held till the end of the transaction, always. A lock in SQL Server needs memory, 96 bytes. Oh my God, we are talking now about bytes, 96 bytes. That's nothing, come on, that's nothing. Of course it's nothing. For one lock, 96 bytes is nothing. But imagine you have not only one lock, maybe you have millions of locks in the lock manager to manage or millions, billions of locks. You need for every lock around 100 bytes. Just think about it. A simple delete statement, a simple update statement can consume hundreds of megabytes of space in the lock manager. And of course, this is main memory. The lock manager is more or less just a memory region used by SQL Server. So we are talking here about main memory consumption when we are talking about the lock manager. And of course, in addition to that memory consumption, to that huge memory consumption, the lock manager also has to manage all those locks. Of course, the more locks you have to manage, the more the scalability of the lock manager will suffer. So just by locking on the finest level, on the row level, doesn't give you a great scalability of the lock manager. And therefore, SQL Server implements so-called lock escalations. As soon as you have on the row level more than 5,000 locks acquired, SQL Server will escalate those individual locks to one lock on the table level. Imagine you're reading in the isolation level, repeatable read, where we are holding our shared locks till the end of the transaction. Imagine you are reading more than 5,000 rows. You acquire more than 5,000 locks, shared locks, and then SQL Server will escalate those shared locks to one shared lock on the table level. Think about it. A shared lock on the table level. Your table is read only because you have read more than 5,000 rules. Nobody else can change that table anymore. Doesn't sound good. But now imagine you're running an update statement or maybe you're running a delete statement. And in that statement, you are touching more than 5,000 rules in the execution plan. SQL Server will escalate those individual exclusive locks on the row level to one exclusive lock on the table level, you don't want to have an exclusive lock on the table level. An exclusive lock on the table level means that nobody else can read and write to that table anymore. Your table belongs to that session which has acquired that exclusive lock. Just think about it. That's a problem, a huge problem. So you can talk about lock escalations from two perspectives, from a good perspective and from a bad perspective. Lock escalations are great because they are improving the performance of the lock manager. Lock escalations are terrible because they are degrading the performance of your queries. Maybe you are ending up with a shared lock or exclusive lock on the table level. Just think about it. And now, to come to the point, a lock escalation would only happen in SQL Server when it's possible 
from the locking perspective. So a lock escalation would never ever block in SQL Server. This would be really, really scary. Imagine you want to perform a lock escalation to improve the performance. And during the lock escalation, you are running into a blocking situation. Oh my God, this would not happen. This would be really, really terrible. So a lock escalation in SQL Server only happens when it's possible from a locking perspective. Otherwise, when it's not possible, SQL Server just continues with acquiring locks on the, on the row level. So SQL Server just try to perform a lock escalation if it succeeds. I'm going here to AdventureWorks. And what I'm doing here is, let's run that in a different session. In AdventureWorks, we just begin a new transaction and I'm acquiring an exclusive log on the, on the last row of the person table. So on the last row of that person table, we just have an exclusive log. We're just updating that row. And we are holding that exclusive log because we are not yet finishing that transaction. So this is again, just a test setup. And what we are doing now in my other session, I'm beginning a new transaction and I'm selecting the first 6,000 rules with the top statement in combination with the query hint hold lock. So hold lock is more or less the same as the isolation level repeatable read. I'm just telling SQL Server here that SQL Server should hold those shared locks till the end of the transaction. Means we are reading from that table, we are acquiring our shared locks, and at some point in time, a lock escalation will be triggered by SQL Server after 5,000 rows. But imagine, can you acquire a shared lock on the table level? No, that's not possible because another session has an incompatible exclusive lock on one row in that table. Therefore, acquiring a shared lock on the table level would lead to a blocking situation. Therefore, that lock escalation will not happen. Easy to prove. Let's go to profiler. Of course, I know I'm doing here terrible things. You can also do that with extended events as you have already seen today. But now let's just use profiler so that people can complain that I'm showing terrible things. Doesn't matter. You already know how to do that with extended events. So let's go here to lock and lock escalations. Let's run that profiler trace and Let's run that statement. When we look into profiler or in your extended event session, doesn't matter, you see there is no lock escalation. The lock escalation hasn't happened. Let's have a look on the whoops, let's have a look into the lock manager. We have here session ID 56. As you can see. We have here, well, you can't see it well, wrong side. Now you see it. We have here more than 7,000 locks in the lock manager. We have locked almost everything. As you can see, we have here thousands of key locks. The SQL Server tried a lock escalation, but the lock escalation didn't succeed. It. So SQL Server just continued with uh, the stupid approach by locking on the key level. So that's the side effect. That's the side effect. You need for each lock around 100 bytes and you are locking much more. Therefore the lock manager also can't scale quite well. So that's the proof that the lock escalation would not always happen. Let's roll back that transaction. 
And now let's roll back the first transaction where we have uh, where we had an exclusive lock. So now by releasing that exclusive lock, a lock escalation can happen. So you can escalate those individual shared locks from the row level to a table level. So let's prove that. Let's run again that transaction. Query has finished. Let's look to profiler. We have a lock escalation. And now let's have a look into the lock manager. Five locks. Just think about it. There are no locks on the page level anymore. And there are also no locks on the key level anymore because we have only one shared lock on the table level means your whole table is read only. So there are advantages and disadvantages. The advantage, you need less space, less memory for the lock manager. The lock manager can better scale the drawback. Your whole table has a shared lock, means you can't access any row in that table for reads, uh, sorry, for writes. So for insert, update, and delete statements. Of course, the shared lock is compatible with a shared lock, means you can have multiple uh, readers, so multiple select statements against that table. But as soon as you are trying to write to that table with an insert, update, delete statement, that statement would block. Doesn't matter which row uh, you are requesting or which row you are changing, because your whole table has now a shared lock. So there are advantages and disadvantages with that approach. But as you have seen here quite nicely, a lock escalation will only happen in SQL Server when it's possible. Let's close now profile again. Of course, these days you should do that with extended events. Okay, let's go back to PowerPoint. And now let's talk about a very, very funny topic in SQL Server online index operations. I always have to smile when I'm talking about them because Microsoft is telling you when you are buying the enterprise edition of SQL Server, so the expensive edition of SQL Server, which costs you a lot of money, Microsoft tells you, you get online index operations means when you have clustered indexes, when you have non-clustered indexes, you can rebuild them. You can create them directly on the fly. You can have a concurrent read-write activity on those tables uh, on which you are maintaining those indexes with online index operations. That sounds great, but more or less Microsoft is fooling you. It's just a fool, nothing more. An online index operation in SQL Server is not an online index operation. I'm really sorry to tell you that, uh, but that's the truth. An online index operation would just mean that you have no blocking situations during that index creation, during that index rebuild. It doesn't matter if you're reading, if you're writing from those tables, you would have no blocking situation. This would be a true online index operation, but the reality is completely different. As you see, SQL Server acquires at the beginning of that online index operation, a shared lock. And at the end of that online index operation, SQL Server acquires, oh my God, a schema modification lock, as we learned previously when we talked about the no lock query hint, the schema modification lock is quite restrictive. It's incompatible with the schema stability lock, which is used by the query optimizer to compile a physical execution plan. And now in your online index operation, SQL Server acquires that schema modification lock at the very end of your online index operation. Hmm. This doesn't work. Of course, there are technical reasons why SQL Server, why Microsoft has to acquire those logs. So there are technical reasons. Otherwise you would have huge problems. 
But the problem that I have is the fact that Microsoft calls them online operations. An online operation is something else. An online operation should never ever plug, but this is here not the case. And now Microsoft has somehow fixed that problem. Beginning with SQL Server 2014, Microsoft introduced so-called lock priorities. So when you have a blocking situation with an online index operation, you can now specify how you would handle that blocking situation. In that case, you have two options. You can roll back the online index operation or you are rolling back those transactions which are blocking the online index operation. So this is more or less a work around. The original problem is not really fixed. Of course, it can't be fixed because this is more or less just by design, as I've said, there are technical reasons why you need those logs. But at least Microsoft gives us with, or beginning with SQL Server 2014, some options how to deal with that problem. So let's switch back to SQL Server Management Studio and let's have a look on those things. Let's create the last database for today. And within that database, I am again creating a very simple table. Really nothing special about that table here. I'm creating on the first column a unique clustered index. You could also have done that with a primary key constraint, would, which would have the same outcome. And then let's just insert into that table three records. So a very, very tiny, small table. And now we just execute that statement in a different session to trigger a blocking situation. So again, we are just holding on the first row of that table an exclusive lock. As we already know, the exclusive lock isn't compatible with the shared lock that an online index operation acquires at the beginning. And of course, the exclusive lock is also in no way compatible with the schema modification lock, uh, which is acquired by the online index operation at the very end. So when we are running now our online index operation, it would lead into a blocking situation. So let's try that. So let's start with the default behavior. I'm just running now the expensive edition of SQL Server Enterprise Edition, or in my case, it's the developer edition. I don't have that money, that much money, or it doesn't make sense in my, in my case to use the Enterprise Edition. And as you can see that rebuild against the table with just three records in it is slow, very, very slow. We could wait here now for hours, for days, for weeks, for centuries, it doesn't matter. That statement will never ever complete as long as that transaction doesn't complete. So more or less, we are blocked by that transaction. So SQL Server acquires at the beginning a shared lock and that shared lock is incompatible with the already granted exclusive lock. Quite easy to prove. We have here a session ID of 65. Let's have a look into the lock manager with session ID 65. And as you can see, we are waiting here on a shared lock. Well, you can not see it quite nicely. I tried that, yeah. You see, we are waiting on a shared lock. Or to make it easier, I could also move the window up easier. So we are waiting on a shared lock. So just think about it. Microsoft calls though, calls that functionality an online index operation. Sorry, this is not an online index operation. Beginning with SQL Server 2014, we have now here so-called lock priorities. Means 
when you have an online index operation, you can specify now what you want to do if you are running into a blocking situation. You can abort yourself, so the online index operation, or you can abort the blockers, the other transactions that are blocking you. And that duration that you are specifying here, those are not milliseconds. Those are not seconds. Sorry, those are minutes, minutes. So after one minute, which is the minimum value, we can specify if we would roll back the blockers or if we roll back the online index operation. So let's try that. That's, that's one of the worst demos that I have because now I have to uh, wait for one minute until I can prove that scenario. So in that case, sequence over here waits now for one minute. And after that one minute, SQL Server would abort the online index operation. If you would specify here blockers, then SQL Server would roll back the blocking transactions. So in our case, it would be transaction 66. In that case, transaction 66 would release the exclusive lock. Therefore, the online index operation can acquire the shared lock. Then we can continue with that online index operation. And finally, at the very end, we can hopefully acquire the schema modification lock, the most restrictive lock in SQL Server. Takes now a few more seconds. And then, in our case, we have specified self. Our transaction is rolled back because we have exceeded that timeout. So that's the story about online index operations in SQL Server. So just think about it. An online index operation is in no way an online index operation. Of course, Microsoft is not fooling you. As I've said, there are technically reasons why Microsoft has to acquire those logs. But the problem that I have is the fact that Microsoft uh, sells them or marketings them as online index operations. Maybe the naming is somehow incorrect or wrong. Maybe they should call them partial online index operations or something. No idea about that one. I'm not the marketing guy. But to be honest, an online index operation is this in no way. Perfect. We are already at the end. So we have seen a lot of things. I have started by talking about the no log query hint. As you have seen, queries with the no log query hint can also block when you have a concurrent uh, modification on that table, schema modification on that table. We have seen that SQL Server can behave in the isolation level read committed, the same as in the isolation level repeatable read when you're dealing with LOB data types in combination with stop and go operators in the execution plan, you have learned that lock escalations are only happening in SQL Server when it's possible from the current locking perspective. And finally, we have seen that an online index operation is in no way an online index operation. So thanks for your time. I hope that you have enjoyed my session. Enjoy the remaining day or the remaining days of that conference. Stay safe and hopefully we can see each other very soon. Thank you. Fantastic job, Klaus. Thank you very much. You did great. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, so um, you do have a couple of questions in the Q&A. And for what it's worth, everyone else, if you have additional questions for Klaus, please uh, you know, pop them into the Q&A as well. Um, but uh, shall we uh, start with Aaron's uh, questions? Do you have them up on your screen already, or do you want me to read them to you? Uh, you can read them to me. It's okay, easier. sure. So Aaron asks, is it a one-time attempt to escalate the lock or will SQL Server continue to try and escalate locks? Uh, SQL Server will try it again after I think 1,250 locks. All right then, um, let's see. So let's see, Barry has a longer kind of question. This is more of a scenario. I have a scenario where transactional replication, i.e. the distribution- I have no idea about the application, <laughs> sorry. No idea about replication. 
<laughs> and I don't either. So uh, I guess we're kind of skipping that <laughs> Maybe one. Maybe so. William Durking from Germany, the UK, U- UK guy, he knows a lot about replication, but sorry. Replication. <laughs> Fair enough. I will never, ever do that in my life. Never, ever. <laughs> I Doesn't know next matter to how much about money you are paying either. me. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> All right, so the next question is, do you have an idea on how to monitor locks that are needed by automatic automatic statistics creation or by update statistics? Well, you could uh, create in some way an extended event session, uh, which just uh, captures that specific SQL statement. And then you can also capture uh, the correlated uh, lock acquired and lock released events with extended events. All right, fantastic. Next question. So what is the difference between an online index rebuild and a regular index rebuild? Well, with an online index rebuild, if there is no blocking situation, it would run with a concurrent read write activity. And with a regular index rebuild, it's just an offline operation, means your whole table, I think, gets a schema modification lock and nobody else can acquire, and nobody else can read and write from that table in the meantime. So more or less, it's an, a traditionally regular index rebuild is just an offline operation. You are taking your whole table offline. All right, fantastic. So that seems to be it for the questions at this point. Oh, actually, no, here's one that just popped in. Um, Mikhail asks, can we target vast amount of blocking problems or with read committed snapshot isolation level? Yes, definitely. So this is also one thing that I'm always recommending when you have a lot of blocking situations between readers and writers, when you have a lot of deadlocks, just enable read committed snapshot isolation. And hopefully your tempdb is uh, not too sad. (laughs) Of course. You also have to think about tempdb. That's the other problem. So there are advantages and also disadvantages. (laughs) 